Good morning. I guess most of you know what my name is. I'm Kim Mosoyonen. You met me in December as I tried to teach you some statistics. And, and now I will, now I'm involved in this course in social psychology. I will keep seven lectures if I have counted right. Starting today with attribution. Tomorrow, the self, the self in social psychology, then some conformity, obedience, persuasion, aggressiveness, attraction, and altruism. I think I got them in order, even. So today, we'll speak about attribution. And this is today's content. I'll start off with some evergreens, three classical theories by some old men <laughs> and then we go over to this main point uh, main classification usually done about attribution attributions are usually classified in internal and external attribution and I guess you already heard about this I think it's written something about this in the Skinner's box book but we have, have a look at that we talk about the fundamental attribution error F or E or correspondence bias as might be a more correct name for it and then we talk about and uh, the actor observer effect false consensus effect it's about uh, how we exaggerate the commonness, commonness of our own beliefs our own opinions our own choices we think that other people think and act similar to ourselves in a higher degree than they actually do some serving biases self-serving bias and the same thing on group level group serving bias okay then we'll see i usually run out of time well i have some extra here if i for some strange reason will talk extra fast today which i don't believe <laughs> I think I speak faster in Swedish than in English, but I have some extra material here. Locus of control, self-perception and over-justification. We'll see if we manage to squeeze that in also. So, you're always welcome to put your hand up and ask questions if you want to. And I'm, I'm not so fussy about putting the hand up either, so... Fritz Heider, you quite commonly named the uh, father of attribution theory he wrote that book the psychology of interpersonal relations that nobody has read i guess well some of some people have i have it in my bookshelf but i haven't read it it's not top 10 list either for the moment but he starts this off, he, he writes this book, it's not much la uh, empirical evidence that he presents in the book, but there are some, some uh, theories, some thoughts here that have received empirical support later. For instance, he makes this distinction between attribution, external and internal attribution, that we will talk about in just a, just a moment. Fritz Heide was a gestalt psychologist, so he, he worked a lot with perception, object perception. And he thought these kind of theories about object perception, they should be applicable also to social perception. So we perceive social, social information, other people and their behavior, our own behavior, ourselves in a similar fashion as we perceive other objects. And, uh, and there are some illusions that we might be the victims of even when it comes to social perception in a similar fashion as there are illusions in in object perception okay i don't think and he also had this thought about that humans tend to exaggerate the importance of internal factors when they're explaining at least other people's behavior and that's the fundamental attribution error that we will talk about in a moment so I don't think I'll speak more about Fritz Heider now we're in the 60s Jones and Davis 
we talk about correspondent inferences. How we conclude that there is a correspondence between people's behavior and their internal dispositions. And they state some, some facts, factors that should increase to what extent we draw these kind of conclusions. So, for instance, we, we perceive a higher degree of correspondence between a person's behavior and her or his internal dispositions if the act is voluntary compared with if it's forced. If a person A hits another person B on the head and there doesn't seem to be any external forces that forces him to do this, we might conclude this is a very aggressive person who goes around and hits people on the head. But if person A does this under gunpoint, hits somebody else on the head, we might not draw this conclusion. If a person does something under external force, we don't see such high overlap between the behavior and the person's, the actor's dispositions. And the same socially inappropriate behavior tells us more about a person's internal dispositions compared with uh, socially appropriate behavior. You all sit there very quiet and well behaved, but I don't draw the conclusion from this that you are very, <laughs> well I might do, but not to a very high extent that you are very quiet and well behaved people. Oh, look, they're not very talkative, this crowd. They're sitting quiet because the social norm uh, requires you to sit quiet in this kind of situation. So you all do this. It doesn't tell, you, tell me much about your personal dispositions. But if somebody, someone of you, started to talk in a very loud voice here, I would probably draw the conclusion, oh, this is a very talkative person. Even if the social norms tells that he or she should be quiet in this situation, she or he still can't keep quiet. So it's a very talkative person. So it might be concluded that uh, unexpected behavior, a behavior that it's, is not expected in a certain kind of situation, tells more about the person actors personal dispositions compared with if the behavior is very expected in that kind of situation and also here the lesser the alternative behaviors the lesser choices a person has the less the act tells about his or her personal dispositions if somebody eats a banana when there's nothing else to eat, we might not conclude, oh, this person really loves bananas. But if a person chooses to eat a banana when there's a lot of other things to eat, we might conclude, oh, this person seems to like bananas. Because he chews that before chocolate and roast beef and uh, other things. So it seems that he, in this situation, likes bananas. Some another point, not a bit set aside compared with the others. According to Jones and Davis, we see a higher degree of correspondence between an actor's behavior and her or his internal dispositions if the behavior has hedonic rele relevance for us. If it has personal relevance for us, we see a higher overlap between the actor's uh, behavior and personal dispositions. So if you read in the paper that a person A has hit another person B on the head, we might not see so much overlap between the aggressive behavior and person A's uh, personality. We might conclude, oh, there must have been very bad situational factors, uh, rough upbringing, and so on and so on. But if we or person B and person A hits us on the head, we don't start to think, oh, there's a lot of bad pers uh, situ situational factors who get, that gets person A to behave violently. We draw the conclusion, oh, this is an asshole. <laughs> so, if, uh, and in the other direction, probably, 
if Bill Gates gives a few billion dollars to Koi, but we don't get it, then we might conclude, ah, he only does that to get some good PR. He's not really a nice guy. <laughs> he only does it to get PR. Pub, is it called PR in English? Well, you know, most of you know what I mean. But if Bill Gates gives us a few million dollars, then we conclude, oh, Bill Gates is a really nice person. Hedonic relevance increases the overlap uh, we perceive in a per actor's behavior and her or his personality. So we jump a couple of years ahead. We come to Kelly's covariation model. You see, this is not different theories. If one of them is correct, it doesn't say that the other is a fault. They're just theories, hypotheses in the same area of attribution. Kelly put forth a theory. He presented three factors that he thought should, should have an effect on, on how we explain an actor's behavior. So if we perceive a behavior, we might ask ourselves, is this behavior consistent? If we know the person, we have observed the person before, we might ask, does he or she usually behave like this? Is it high or low consistency? And we might, might ask ourselves, is this, is this behavior distinct? Does the actor behave like this only in these kind of situations? Or might it be that he or she behaves like this in many different kind of situations? Is it high or low distinctiveness? And if there is, or, or other people's present in the situation, we might ask ourselves, is there consensus? How does the other people behave? Do they behave similarly as this particular actor does? Is it high or low consensus? And if we have these three factors and we make them dichotomous, high or low in all three, we get eight combinations. So, Let's have an example here. Okay, we have a person here, Lisa. Let's call her Lisa. She's sitting at the cinema and she's laughing her head off. Okay, and then we ask ourselves, why is Lisa sitting there laughing her head off? And then we have, we ask, is it consistent, distinct, and is there consensus? And we get eight combinations. And imagine, let's take this. Number five, consistency, yes, high consistency. Lisa is drunk. Well, uh, you should, would have to put something more in there. She's drunk, okay, is she usually drunk? I, I was more thinking that she laughs consistently. Yes. And consistently. She, she always laughs when she goes to the cinema. Okay, so then it's probably not the drunk part. <laughs> We've seen Lisa in the cinema many times and she's always laughing her head off when she's there. But is the behavior distinct? No. Low distinctiveness. Lisa is always laughing her head off when she is at the cinema, but she's always laughing her head off even in other kind of situations. When she goes to the hairdresser, she sits there and laughs her head off. At work, she sits and laughs her head off. At dinner, she always laughing her head off. <laughs> so high consistency, but low distinctiveness. How about consensus? No. There's a lot of other people in the cinema, in the movie theater with Lisa, but nobody else is laughing. Everybody else is crying. Lisa is sitting there by herself, laughing her head off. Everybody else is crying. <laughs> so, what do we think? How do we explain Lisa's behavior? In this, if we come up with this combination. Any idea? She's a person who laughs. Yeah. She's a really happy person. She's always laughing in every kind of situation, even if everybody else is crying, she's still laughing. She's a really happy person. 
Yes? Do you feel that? You would probably come to some kind of conclusion like this, if you know Lisa and you had this kind of information. How about number seven? Consistency. Yes, she's always laughing when she's at the cinema. Distinctiveness. Yes, she's only laughing when she's at the cinema. In other kind of situations, she's not laughing. She's only laughing when she's at the cinema. Consensus. No. Everybody else is crying. So Lisa laughs when she's at the cinema, but only at the cinema, and now she's sitting there laughing her head off while everybody else is crying. Yeah, she enjoys movies, exactly, she, or something. Maybe she really loves this building or something. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. They show Schindler's List, but she really enjoys to be in this. <laughs> so she's laughing her head off. Something with the cinema or movies. Okay. Number one and three, I couldn't really make any distinction here. So consistency, no, she, Lisa is usually not laughing when she's at cinema, but now she does. Distinctiveness we could skip, I didn't mind get it in to discriminate, but consensus, no, everybody else is crying. So Lisa usually doesn't laugh when she's at the cinema, but now she does, even if everybody else is crying. What do you say? How do we explain Lisa's behavior? She likes the movie. Yes, it's something particular with this movie she's enjoying. And only her. <laughs> Everybody else is crying. So it's some kind of interaction between this particular movie and Lisa. Something in that combination. You see, uh, interaction effect. <laughs> you just had analysis of variance. This is an uh, example of that. <laughs> okay. Distinctiveness, this, I didn't know how it would. How about the rest here? How does the rest of the examples differ from this I presented here? Yes. Lisa, don't matter, she sometimes she loves at movie or all time distinctiveness. Okay, but she's sitting there laughing and everybody else is laughing. So what kind of conclusion do we draw from this? It's a funny movie. Yeah, it's something funny with this movie. It makes everybody laugh. So this, we have both external, in some cases we draw con external uh, cause as an explanation for this. If everybody does, behaves in a similar way in the situation, it's something with the situation. If there is no consensus, then it's some kind of internal explanation. It has something to do with Lisa, but according if it's consistent behavior, yes or no, or it's high or low consistency, the internal explanation is a bit different. The, the question is, the, some people have criticized Kelly for this. Is this how we really function? Is this psychology or is it <laughs> logic? You see, is this how it should function? Well, it sounds quite logical. That it's logical to draw this kind of conclusion. If everybody behaves in the same, same way in a situation, it's something with the situation. If only one person acts like this, it's something with the person, and so on. The question is if we really behave like this. If we really draw conclusions according to these rules put out in the covariation model. So now we come to this. The main distinction that has been made in, in the attribution field, distinction between internal and external attribution. And I already mentioned this. Internal attribution, we explain an actor's behavior with his or her personality, his or her personal dispositions his or her opinions or something like that. It has something to do with the actor. Or external attribution. We explain the behavior with the situational factors. Something in the f situation that makes the actor behave like this in this situation. 
Okay, and we talk quite a lot about this. And then we have this classical fundamental attribution error. Some people don't like that name. Fundamental. What's so darn fundamental about it? <laughs> Another... There is, there is a researcher who, who claimed that he had found the ultimate attribution error. As the answer is, oh, you only have the fundamental attribution. I have the ultimate attribution error. <laughs> it's a, yes, it's a gru group serving bias that we will come to uh, later on. That somebody, peop somebody to call the ultimate attribution error. And another criticism, is it really an error? Is it wrong to do this? It might be a bias, but is it an error? So, a more my, a might maybe a more correct name for this is correspondence bias. Anyway, the fundamental attribution is uh, there is some indi indications that we have a um, tendency to e exaggerate the importance of internal factors and downplay the importance of external factors when we explain other people's behavior. And that's a point here, others' behavior. It doesn't see, seem to function, we don't, don't seem to function like this when we explain our own behavior. It's when we explain other people's behavior. If we take this correspondence bias instead, it's a bit different. Then a more appropriate description would be like this. The tendency to exaggerate the correspondence between an actor's behavior and internal dispositions. But they're more or less the same, these two. Okay, um, you might have heard about this classical study. Okay, you see this is subject. The subjects in my slides are scratching their head. Not all of them, but some of them. Okay, and I also like his haircut, so I have to this. <laughs> it's something nice with this haircut, don't you? Yeah. I don't know why I think so. No. <laughs> okay, we have subjects, they read an essay, and in this essay, this essay either argue about the, how wonderful it is with the Castro regime in Cuba. It has have a lot of good effects on the Cuban society and so on. So it, it's a pro-Castro essay. Or it's an anti-Castro essay that argues that the Castro regime is really horrible and so on. So either pro-Castro or anti-Castro. And the subjects are told that whoever wrote this essay uh, did it had, could choose between writing anti or pro. So if it's written anti, that's what this writer chooses, or if it's written pro Castro, this is what the writer chooses to do. Either this information, or they were told that the writer could not choose. The writer was told, whatever your own opinions, you have to write pro Castro, or you have to write anti Castro. Try to do it as good as you can. So, we have a two by two here. We have either pro Castro, anti Castro, and information if the writer could choose freely what to write or was told what to write. And after this, the subjects are told or asked to rate on several questions what do they think about the writer's attitude toward the Castro re regime. How positive attitude do the subjects think that the writer has toward the Castro regime? And then, not surprisingly, if they were told that the writer could choose between writing anti or pro, they view, they perceive the writer as more, had, having more positive attitude towards the Castro regime if he or she has written argued pro Castro compared with anti-Castro. Not so surprising. If a person has chosen freely to do either uh, one way or another, 
the subjects perceive high correspondence between the writer's uh, behavior and his or her attitude. But, what do we see here? If the subject so told, the writer could not choose, was told either to argue pro or anti, then they should, we might argue, then they should think, okay, this person didn't choose what to write, so how good they, well they argue in the either way it might be <laughs> just a measurement of their intelligence or something, doesn't say anything about their attitudes toward Castro. So even a person who is very anti-Castro might deliver arguments why it's good with the Castro regime and in the opposite way. But what do we see? So we, we might argue there should be no difference, but what do we see? Well, we see there's quite a large difference there. Even if the subjects are told this person could not choose how to behave, they still see a high level of correspondence between the action, the behavior, and the person's attitudes. If a person has been told to write pro-Castro, the subjects see this person as more pro-Castro than if the writer has been told to be anti-Castro. So this information about how freely the action has been chosen doesn't and how, how do you call it? Annulate. Annulate this difference. Yes? You seem a little bit awkward with this. <laughs> but then, of course, we could ask, is this, a, is this an error? Is it wrong to function like this? Does this indicate the stupidness of the humankind that we have a difference here? We might argue there should be it, no. <coughs> oh, well, of course, if somebody, we could, might be, might argue, if somebody is really, 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 really anti-Castro and is told, now you have to write a uh, essay pro-Castro, what will the person do? Refuse to do it. Hell no, I won't do that. <laughs> so, it. We, we might argue, if a person has accepted to do this, it might ha have a small indication if the person is really anti-Castro or pro-Castro. Actor-observer effect. Half of this is the fundamental attribution, error or correspondence bias. According to this actor-observer effect, we see a high correspondence between other people's actions and their behavior. We have a tendency to explain other people's behavior with their internal dispositions. He or she does like that, behaves like that, because he or she or is this kind of person. But that doesn't seem to be in place when we explain our own behavior. When we explain our own behavior, we usually do that with external factors. I behaved like this because the situation was like it was. So we explain our own behavior with external factors and other people's behavior with internal factors. That's what this actor-observer effect is about. Okay, I tried to find some empirical evidence. I found some found this, for instance, not a very impressive study, but it's quite widely uh, cit cited. Okay, they only had male subjects in this study. We have male, male students, and they are asked to write down, to explain, why do they have the girlfriend they have? I guess they all have girlfriends. Why do you have the girlfriend you have? Explain why do you have why that is the case, and they were also asked to explain why do you study the course at the university university that you are studying. Explain that, and then they were asked to do the same thing for a good friend. They were asked to think about the friend, and then why does your uh, why does your friend have the girlfriend he has, and why does he study the course at the university that he is studying. So they write down these explanations, 
Raters read this and they code the explanation, uh, explanations as either internal or external explanations. And then we have a look at the result. Okay. So the subjects explain their own behavior mainly with external causes. More exter they give more external causes for their own behavior than they give internal causes. And a slight difference in the other uh, direction when they explain their friend's behavior. So I, for instance, I have the girlfriend I have because she is lovely. <laughs> it's an external explanation. It's not, it's not about me, it's about her. While my good friend has the girlfriend he has because he likes that kind of girls. <laughs> It's something with his dispositions that makes him behave like this. I studied a course at the university I studied because it's a very interesting course. It's an interesting course. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with me that I think it's an interesting course. No, it's an interesting course. That's why I study it. While my friend studies the course he does because he likes that kind of stuff. Something like that. So we give more internal explanation to other people's behavior and more external causes to our own behavior. Okay, do you have some criticism of this? Well, it, of course, it might be some kind of pure verbal effect. How do we say? We say, I studied a course at the university because it's interesting. If I was asked, do you think it's interesting? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Then suddenly I give it an internal explanation. But I don't write that. I, I, re, I study the course because I think it's interesting. It's the same thing. When I say it is interesting, I mean I think it's interesting. That's how we use the language. While we explain other people's behavior, we say he thinks like this. So it might be just exactly the same explanation internal or external, but we don't use the language that way. So it's not certain that it's a real difference in how we perceive causes to our own behavior and others. It might be a, something with the language. But, okay, we, let's say we accept this, that they exist, the fundamental attribution error and the actor-observer effect. If we skip this verbal, this semantic explanation, do you have any other possible explanations for this? Why do we see a high correspondence between other people's behavior and their dispositions, but not for ourselves? Well, maybe you could imagine that it's a good idea to infer uh, personal dispositions about uh, other people rather than just uh, like I have a constant picture of who Kimo is and what he likes and what he does and that could have an advantage for me somehow what kind of advantage well I sort of I, I know how you work and it's a oh it saves processing power uh -huh. because I can have one fixed picture which sort of but why not about your own behavior in the same way why not have a I, fixed I picture of your own okay, well maybe because I see all my internal uh, I mean, I can't see what you're feeling. No. So, but but I can. Uh, uh, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> I, I can. It's very easy for me to uh, perceive why I like my girlfriend. Yes. But it, but I can't always see why you like your girlfriend. No. I can only see the outside factors that she's good looking and she has money or you know. Yes. Yes. I yes. At it's pretty much the same as I had. We have more information about our, ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I have perceived my own behavior in many different kind of situations. So I have a lot of information. Sometimes I behave like this, sometimes I behave a little different. Sometimes I'm nervous, sometimes I'm not nervous. Sometimes I'm happy and so on and so on. It's a large variation in how I behave in different kind of situations, and I have information about this. 
So if I explain, well, uh, sometimes I behave like this, sometimes I behave like that, so it's not about me. I can behave very differently. So if I behave in a certain way in a situation, it has to do with the situation. I'm aggressive here, but yesterday I wasn't aggressive, so I'm not the aggressive person. It has something to do with the situation. While other people's behavior, we have much less information about. Even those we know very well, we have much less information about. If, for instance, working colleagues, in what kind of situation do we observe them? Well, mainly in one kind of situation, at the work. And maybe we all tend to behave in a similar way at the work. But I have observed myself at the work, at home, and so on. But my colleagues, I own, maybe I only have observed at the work, and maybe they behave in a certain way, but not because they are that kind of persons, but because they are at work. But I failed to see this, and I start to think, oh, she is very talkative, or he is very shy, and so on. So less information about the variation in other people's behavior than compared with our own. And it's quite funny, one situation factor is always present when we observe other people's behavior. What situational factor is that? Yes, I am there. <laughs> I don't know if you have friends, acquaintances. I have a few who is quite pessimistic and sometimes they say things like that. Oh, people are so stupid. They behave in such a stupid way. And I started to say like this. Well, it's only when you are there that people act stupidly. <laughs> I observed when you are at the place, when you are present, I also see people behave stupidly. But when you go away, they actually, suddenly they become very smart. <laughs> so if you, if you think, oh, people are, are always so sullen and in bad behavior, bad mood and so on, maybe it's because you are there. <laughs> so you should, it's something you all should think about. <laughs> well, of course, now it's so, nowadays it's, we get information about people's behavior even if we are not there on YouTube and so on so it's it's, it's good <laughs> okay so this might be one factor another theory another possible explanation is that it's some kind of perceptual effect what do we focus on if I am in a situation and I behave what do I focus on well, not on myself. I focus on the situation. What happens there? What does he do now? And so on. So I have focused on the situation. I take this information in. And if I'm asked, why did you behave like this? Well, that's the information I have. He did like this, then that happened, and so on. I have focused on this, then I use it when I explain my own behavior. While an observer who observes somebody else acting, what does the observer focus on? Well, on the actor. Why does he, what does he do now? Now he does like this, then that. And then if I'm asked, why did he behave like this? Well, maybe I have focused on him or her as a person. Then I might use this as an explanation of his or her behavior. The actor is a part of the situation. The way you act is part of my situation. Yes. So if I observe my, my situation, your disposition is something, is a part of my situation. Yes, and you might, you might uh, explain your behavior with my disposition. Yeah. Yes. And with the desk's disposition. Yes. And uh, with this room's disposition. Yes. Because you're all part of my situation. Yes. But you might miss the fact that <laughs> you are also a part of the situation. Because it's nothing you focus on. Oh, how do I behave now in this situation? Yeah. <laughs> Other people's act, we only react. <laughs> okay. And we'll have a look at a nice study about this in a moment. Some have also made this point that there might be some cultural differences. This main categorization of different cultures you, um, you might have heard about individu individualistic cultures and collectivistic cultures. And we, Sweden is supposed to be quite individualistic, 
even if we Finns don't think so. <laughs> well, okay. According to Finns, Swedes are just slightly more individualistic than they are in India or something like that. Okay, but okay, individualistic cultures, we emphasize the persons, the people, in the, the individual. And then it might sound quite logical that if we emphasize the individual, then we also explain people's behavior with their internal dispositions. That's part of the package, to focus on the individual, to emphasize the individual. While in other cultures, if you emphasize, if you emphasize the community, then you might explain people's behavior with external factors. So it might be that we get socialized in a way to explain behavior that's emphasized in the culture that we grow up in. We'll have a look at this nice study. It's quite intriguing. <laughs> one theory, one possible explanation that's been put forth to this actor-observer effect is the, the it has to do with perception. It's a perceptual effect. Actors perceive the situation while observers perceive the actor. And this might be one part of the explanation for the actor-observer effect. So these storms, storm, <coughs> he tried to figure out, is, is there anything to this explanation, perceptual explanation? So he put forth this quite intriguing experiment. So we have subjects, they're grouped into groups of four. And two of these persons are uh, actors. They are uh, having a conversation with each other about some oh, get to get to know each other conversation. And while they do this, they are observed. So uh, one observer each for the actors. And also one of the actors is videotaped while they are having this conversation. And after this conversation, all four pe persons look at this videotape that shows actor one, and then they are asked to explain why the actors behave, behaved as they did in this situation. So observer two have been watching actor two, then he w watches this video of actor one, and then he's asked to explain why did actor two behave as he did. If I rem remember right, it was only male subjects in this study. That means that before explaining actor two's behavior, observer two get to see the same information as actor two did in the situation. Observer 2 will see how this situation looked like from actor 2's perspective. You understand? Mm -hmm. This video tape will show this, uh, give the same information as actor 2 received while they were having a conversation. Okay. Let's go. Observer 1 is going to explain actor 1's uh, behavior after looking at this videotape. Does observer, two, observer 1 receive any new information from this videotape? No, because it will show the same thing all over again. Observer 1 has been observing actor 1 and then he sees the, this tape and it shows the same thing. Actor 1 acting in the situation. So no change of perspective for observer 1. The same thing for actor 2. Actor 2 has been perceiving actor 1 while they're having a conversation and then he sees the same thing all over again in this videotape. So no change in perspective for observer 1 and actor 2. While for actor 1, before explaining his own behavior, he sees a videotape of himself. So he will first observe himself as an observer and then explain his own behavior. So he will 
receive an observer perspective, change of perspective. And if the actor-observer effect is due to some kind of perceptual effect, then this change of perspective, change of perceptual perspective, should ha have an effect on how they explain the behavior. You follow this? It's very nicely thought, I think. It's quite intriguing. So let's have a look on the result. So we have a control group also, no movie. And on, the, on this axis here we have internal minus external. So they write down, the observers explain the actor's behavior and the actors uh, explain their own behavior. The explanations are coded, internal and external explanations, and for every person a uh, difference score is calculated. Number of internal explanations minus number of external explanations. So the higher the bar is here, the more internal explanations are given to the actor's behavior. Then we see in the control condition, observers with no no videotape, observers give more internal explanations to the actor's behavior than the actors do themselves. It could be negative also if somebody gives more external explanations to the behavior than internal. We see here that all, even, even the actors give more internal explanations to their own behavior than they give external. So it's not completely in accordance with the uh, actor-observer effect. But at least observers give more internal explanations in relation to external to the actor's behavior than the actors do themselves. So it could be this difference between the black bars is at least somewhat in accordance with the actor-observer effect. Okay, let's see at the actors here. When they see a movie from their own perspective, that means they see a movie that shows the other actor, okay? Then they give even less internal explanations to their own behavior. They get information about the situation one more time. They have been looking at the other actor and then now they see a movie that shows the same thing. They give even less internal explanations for their own behavior, right? But what happens if an actor looks at the movie, a video that shows himself, and then explains his own behavior? So I've been acting in this situation, I've been looking at the other actor, now I see a video that shows me how I behave in the situation, and then I'm asked to explain my own behavior, and what happens? Suddenly people give a lot of internal explanations to their own behavior. Is that in accordance with this perceptual theory about this uh, actor-observer effect? Yes, so now they have focused on themselves and then they give internal explanations to their behavior. And for observers, if they see a movie, a video that shows the actor's perspective, they see the same thing as the actor did in the situation. How do they explain the actor's behavior? In a similar fashion as the actor does himself. Less internal explanations. So, if I get to see what you saw in the situation, I explain your behavior in a similar way as you do yourself. If an observer gets to see the actor point of view, then they explain the behavior in a similar way as the actor does him or herself. You see, the difference between these bars is not a big one. If the observer gets to see a video from the same perspective as they already seen, get the same information all over again, it doesn't affect how they explain the behavior compared with the control situation. Okay, so this study indicates how we explain the actor-observer effect, the discrepancy how actors and observers explain actors' behavior, 
has to do something with the perceptual perspective. If we change the perceptual perspective, we also receive a change in how people explain behavior. So there seems to be something to this thought, this possible explanation. As I said, according to some thoughts, some theories, this has also to do with cultural differences. Some cultures emphasize the individual, other cultures emphasize the community, and a part of this emphasis might also be how we explain behavior, with internal factors or external factors. So this is a cross-cultural study. Okay, from what country are those subjects? Do you see that? <laughs> US. US. That's why they have cowboy hats. Okay. And those subjects, what country are they from? India. India. So we have subjects from India and the US and in different ages. Adults and children at various ages. Okay. And all subjects are told to describe and explain two examples of negative and positive behavior that they have experienced. So I'm asked, write down when you experienced when somebody behaved in a positive way, describe the event and explain why did this person behave in a positive or negative way. So two examples each. So every subject write down four examples of behavior and how they explain this behavior. Again, these answers, these descriptions are read by raters and the descriptions are rated, categorized either as internal explanation or external explanations and we'll have a look at the results here. Okay, so the upper panels here are internal explanations. The higher the uh, bar, the more internal explanations are given to the behavior we have negative and positive behavior here. As you see, for eight years, eight year olds, there isn't much, much difference between India and the States. Children explain the behavior in a similar fashion. If you look at the subjects from India, it's not much difference between the age groups. Adults give negative behavior, internal explanations, to more, more or less the same amount as does children. While in the US, the number of the rate of internal explanations given to negative behavior increases with age. Yes? And not as clearly, but something similar for positive behavior. Higher increase with age for in, given internal explanations in the US, but not so much in, in India. And in the opposite way for ex, uh, external explanations given. For negative behavior, not, rate of e external explanations increases with age in India, but not so much in the States. Not much difference for children, a much bigger difference for adults. And okay, that's not so clear, but let's say it's, it's at least doesn't go in the opposite direction. So what would this indicate? How do children explain behavior in different cultures? Well, of course, we have only data for two here, but <laughs> this would indicate that it isn't much, much difference. Children explain behavior in a similar way. They give about the same amount of internal and external explanations, independent of, of the culture. Yes? I'm sorry, but the, the percentages don't add up to 100 if you add them. So is there some kind of explanation that isn't needed internal or...? Yes, there are a lot of explanation that couldn't be categorized as either. Especially so for children, <laughs> as you see. If you add up, the sums are lower for children than for adults. So, yes, that's, that's true. But this would indicate not much difference how children explain behavior with e internal or external uh, factors uh, in, the pa in different cultures. But as, as they get older, they, so to speak, 
this would indicate they get socialized into how do we explain behavior in this culture. In the States, the culture is we explain behavior with internal factors. We explain people's behavior with their internal dispositions. And as people get older and older, they adapt to this norm more and more and explain behavior more and more with internal factors. And in India, the opposite way. The norm is in India, we, behave, we explain behavior with external factors. And the older people get, they get socialized into this and they adapt to it and they explain p behavior, other people's behavior more and more with external factors. So this would indicate that it's a cultural factor in this, how we explain behavior. Or cultural norms about how this should be done. And we adapt to these norms. And now we throw it all out. I found this uh, last year in Istanbul. Okay, there isn't any actor observer effect. <laughs> <laughs> it's only bogus. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. <laughs> isn't it? I, um, I don't know how half an hour textbook example. I've, this is still in many textbooks. I Actually, I don't know if Kendrick and those have so much about <laughs> actor observer effect but it's still in many textbooks but according to Mal here it doesn't exist <laughs> it doesn't show up so this is a so-called uh, funnel plot so it's a meta meta analysis so every dot here is a study okay and on the x-axis here we have effect size the more to the right, the more the study founds, the stronger evidence the study founds, finds for the actor-observer effect. So the more to the right, the more the result is in accordance with the actor-observer effect. Zero means no difference between actor and observer, how they explain actor behavior. Negative values indicates a result opposite the actor observer effect. Negative value means that actors give their own behavior internal explanations to a higher degree than observers does. In the opposite way. And you see there's a, or almost as many studies on the negative side as on the positive side. On this axis we have one divided with the standard error. And you all know what standard error is, how that is calculated, right? Right? Yes. How is standard error calculated? <laughs> you take the standard deviation and you divide it with the square root of the sample size, exactly. <laughs> so this is a proxy for how big the study is. The further down here, the bigger the study, the more subjects they have. And you see, as when the studies get bigger and bigger, the more the result is in the middle. No result whatsoever. <laughs> so this could indicate there isn't any, <laughs> any actor observer effect. Some studies found it. I guess this study I've mentioned is somewhere here. But there are just as many studies who don't find it. And the bigger the study is, the more the possibility that you don't find anything. It doesn't exist. And this is so fun. Okay, Mal also plotted the effect size. So the higher the value here, the more the result is in accordance with the actor-observer effect. And we find a difference over time. In the 70s, people behaved in accordance with the actor-observer effect, but not anymore. <laughs> so what do we think? Do we, do we believe, oh, in the 70s, the actor-observer effect was true? Then people really behaved like this, but nowadays, not anymore. Well, of course, that's one possibility, but another maybe bigger possibility is that somebody found this actor observer effect and it came oh look here interesting effect oh you didn't find it okay uh, we don't publish you 
Go out there and do some research that finds this again. It's really a fun effect. Oh, some more studies that didn't find. No, you didn't get published. Oh, you find in accordance. Okay, we publish you. So it's probably some kind of publication bias. In the 70s, this was new stuff. Editors thought, thought this was fun, so they took in studies that found results in accordance with the actor-observer effect. Probably it was more difficult to get your study published if this didn't show up. You see Thomas Kuhn, you see Kuhn here in action. More anomalies is uh, generated after a while. Oh, this, I think this is the thousand studies somebody sent to me that is not, isn't in accordance with the actor-observer effect. Maybe we should do something about this. And in the end also those studies get published and the actor-observer effect vanishes. Now it even seems to be some kind of reaction in the opposite way. <laughs> so nowadays you should find a result in the opposite way and to get your study published. Okay, Mal also categorized, he, he wrote that sometimes this is found, but there are some criteria that should be fulfilled to get this to find this actor-observer effect. He present these facts. For instance, this fifth one. If the behavior is negative, so if, if I do something, if an actor does something, behaves in a way that is not appropriate, I might get criticized for this. Then you see the actor-observer effect. If I do something that others don't approve of, then I explain my own behavior with external factors. I hit B on the head because it was a bad situation, while others might give my behavior internal explanations. But it doesn't show up generally for all different kinds of behavior. Not for positive behavior. If I do something positive, if I get a good grade on some exam, Heck, I'm not going to explain that with external factors. Oh, I got the good result because it was an easy test. No, I got the good result because I'm so clever. So, it has, has to do with the behavior also, if it could be categorized as negative or positive. Mal and colleagues, they present their own theory of uh, attribution, full conceptual theory of explanation. Okay, should I, how much should I say about this? I say a few things. Okay, they present these possible explanations for behavior. Intentional behavior or unintentional behavior. Let's focus on intentional behavior. Intentional behavior might be explained with reasons or causal history. Reasons, well, people have reasons for what they do. I did, did, did this because of. And causal history is more than you explain people's behavior with factors that led to the reasons. And reasons in their turn have more subcategories, beliefs that emphasizes a cognitive, cognitive process. The actor thought that, the actor draw the conclusion that you emphasize some kind of cognitive process as a cause to the behavior. And these beliefs, in their turn, can be categorized in marked. You emphasize that it's a belief that this specific actor has. He came to the conclusion that. Unmarked, then you don't emphasize that it's this person holding the belief. It might be a general belief that most people has, or something like that. Desires, more emotional factor, wishes and needs. She did like this because she wanted to achieve this. Or she wanted to. Okay. So they make this kind of uh, categorization of, of different explanations to behavior. And in this, in this article, they, I think they had like six studies that they looked at this. And they found these differences. Okay. They didn't find any difference between actor and observer to what extent they uh, explain behavior with external or internal generally 
So no differences here, the actor-observer effect doesn't show up in their studies here. But what they find is that actors explain their own behavior with reasons and unmarked beliefs to a higher extent than observers does. I did this because of, and I give reasons for this. And I don't say, I did this because I believe that. I say, I did it because it is like this. I don't specify that it's my personal beliefs. I, so to speak, try to give a picture that this is something, it's obvious to everybody that it is in this way. So that's how actors explain their own behavior. While observers, to a higher extent, explain actors' behavior with causal history, he must have uh, had a rough upbringing or something like that. That's why he thinks like this today. That's why he behaves like this. So causal history, desires and marked beliefs. He did like this because he has the causal history he has. That's why he wants to achieve X. And he thinks, he thinks that to behave in this way is a good way to achieve this. So more, des more desires and more beliefs when we explain other people's behavior. More reasons and unmarked beliefs when we explain our own behavior. Okay. Next point here, false consensus effect. The tendency to exaggerate the commonness, commonness of our own beliefs, our own choices, and so on. We exaggerate uh, the, the degree that other people should have behaved similarly to ourselves. Okay, and we have a classic study on this. <laughs> In the beginning I thought they made people do this, the subjects do this, but they only asked them to, if they would agree to do, do this. So it's not as fun. It would have been fun if they actually made the made the subjects walk around with these sandwich boards, but that wasn't the case. So we have subjects, and they are asked, would they, be, would they be willing to walk around on campus with a sandwich board? Either to some of them they say, with the text, repent. Would you be willing to walk around on campus with this sandwich board? As a part of an experiment, he said. As a part of an experiment, would you be willing to walk around with this? Either with the text repent or eat as Joe's. Ungrayer, värden går under, repent. Innan det är för sent. So it's some kind of religious uh, message. Okay, so some of these subjects we have, what do we have? 80 subjects, 48 of these say, well, sure, yes, I would be willing to walk around with a sandwich bar like this. And 32 says, no, I wouldn't be willing to do that. So some are willing, some are not. And then they are asked also, all subjects are asked, of, of all the students, we ask this question, how many do you think will say yes and no? How many of those others that we ask would be willing, willing to walk around with this sandwich board? And what do we see? Though of those 48, those 48 who would be willing to walk around with a sandwich board like this, they uh, predict that on average 62% of the others would be willing to do this and 38% would not be willing to do this. Actually, that's a good prediction because the real share is 60 and 40%. So it's a good prediction. So. And of those 32 who say that would not be willing to walk around with a sandwich board, what do they say? Well, they say that on average they guess that 33% would be willing to walk around it and 67 would not be willing to walk around with it. So what does this indicate? Well, people think that a majority of others would make the same choice as I did. If I make choice X, I think a majority of others would make, also make choice X. If I make choice B, 
I think a majority of others will do that also. False consensus effect. I have a, in the same in the same study they also had a part like this. The subjects are asked to read a short description of the person. So they read a short description. We have a person here. He or she likes to do this, doesn't like to do that, some information. And then they also get the information. When we ask this person if he or she would be willing to walk around with the sandwich board, he said yes. Or he or she said no. Okay, so they get some information about this person. And then they are also asked to rate this person from the information that you have received how shy do you think this person is or how aggressive do you think this person is how cooperative do you think this person is and so on they make this assessment for every trait they make this assessment on a scale from minus 50 to plus 50 and they get the information at zero on this scale means the average so if I think this person is as shy as people are on average then I mark the zero if I think the person is more shy than the average then I give a positive rating if I think he's less shy I give a negative rating and so to think that this person is the more unusual they seem to think that this person is so what do we see here who who do the subjects think is deviant unusual well a person who makes a choice that they self didn't do so those 48 persons who states that they self are willing to walk around with a sandwich board they think that people who are not willing to walk around with a sandwich board are more unusual than those that like themselves are willing to walk around with a sandwich board the person made the opposite choice from myself he is more deviant than a person who make the same choice as I do and the same for those who were not willing to walk around with a sandwich board. I don't know if you, this sounds so bad, this is how I function. I always think that people who behave in a way that I wouldn't do myself, they are very unusual and strange people. <laughs> because I usually think, why, why would it be like that? Yeah. And what choices do we make in every situation? The obvious choice, the more logical choice. In every situation, I, I assess the situation and I make the most logical uh, choice in this situation. In this situation, the information is like this. The most obvious way to behave is like this. And then I do it. It has nothing to do with my personality. I just adapt to how you, I should behave in this situation. And then I think, well, of course, everybody else would do the same thing because it's an obvious thing to do in this situation. If I get the information that somebody else did something different, I say, oh, he must be very special, this person. <laughs> must have very unique opinions about things and so on. Very unusual person. Behaves in a way that I wouldn't do. No? You never think like this. More recent study, uh, British students are asked, do you use cannabis, do you use amphetamine, yes or no? And in this case they found that everybody who uses amphetamine also uses cannabis. So they were, this could make made into three groups. No users, cannabis only users, amphetamine and cannabis users. And then they were asked, how many of the other students do you think uses cannabis and amphetamine? And what do we see? Non-users think, predict it's a less, uh, less common among other students to use cannabis compared with cannabis and amphetamine users. 
And for amphetamine, it's those who don't use either and those who only use cannabis think it's more uh, less common to use amphetamine compared with those who actually use amphetamine. So this could also be seen as a false consensus effect. If I behave in a certain way, I think it's more of others that behave in a similar way compared with if I don't behave in this way. Okay, why? Why do you, that, why do you think our own choices, our own behavior is more usual than it actually is? What possible explanations do we have for this? Is it, is it stupid that we work this way? Is, uh, is it an uh, indication of our lack of cognitive capacity or something like that? Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I think you're thinking the same thing. I think as I do. <laughs> well, of course, if if we don't have so much information about other people's behavior, it's probably quite logical to use our own behavior as some kind of anchor, of some kind of. It's at, at least one piece of information of how people behave. I behave like this. If I don't know, if I don't have so much information about how other people behave, it's probably quite logical to use my own behavior as an indication of how other people could be expected to behave. No? Don't you think so? Yes, some people think they are very and it's deviant. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's not in accordance with this. It's in the opposite. Yeah, usually uh, one, one uh, distinction that is made that it's usually said that we think our, opin our opinions are very common. If I think in a certain way, if I have an opinion, I, I tend to exaggerate how common these opinions are. But if I have a talent, I'm good at something, then I tend to be in the opposite, opposite direction. I think I'm better than others at performing something. I think others have my, the same opinions as I have, but they don't have my capacity to perform. So in one way we exaggerate opinions, but talent we tend to downplay. I think we're more special in that way uh, than, than others are. Yes. Yes. Then you have information about your own behavior, and the information you have about other people's behavior doesn't tend to be a good sample of the total population, because the people you tend to observe tend to be more like you than the average. So it would be, in lack of other data, we use ourselves, but also our friends and those who we observe. And maybe we miss the fact that m our friends tend to be more similar to ourselves than average, the average Joe. So it's also in this. It's a, quite, there's all this kind of anchoring, anchoring and adjustment explanation to many kind of things. So we use ourselves and maybe our friends as an anchor. That's our starting point. Okay. 
So if I use cannabis, then I might think, okay, I use cannabis. So how many of others? Well, 100% of those I know use cannabis, but I guess there could be somebody out there who doesn't use it. So I make an adjustment. The anchor is 100%, the actual information I have. But I make an adjustment because I realize that my information is not complete information. So I make an adjustment. I probably lessen the number from 100%. But usually that adjustment is not big enough. So the anchor has a stronger effect on our predictions than they should have. It's like if we read a paper and it tells us about, oh, it was many people died in the traffic this weekend. And then we are asked about how dangerous is it to be out in the traffic. Then we have this information. Oh, a lot of people died this weekend. That's our anchor. But maybe we think, maybe it was something special with this weekend. So we make an adjustment. It's not as dangerous generally as it was this weekend. So you make an adjustment, but that adjustment tends to be too small. So the information we actually have, have too strong effect on our predictions than they actually should have. Something like that. This adjustment, anchoring adjustment theory is usually have this kind of, uh, they look like this. Okay, another possibility is also, uh, even if we might think that we are <laughs> strange in some way, not everybody, it's quite unusual to behave in this way, we might not want to perceive ourselves as uh, some kind of deviant persons. So we exaggerate the commonness of our own behavior in order to feel better about ourselves. Might be something like this also. If I use cannabis, I think I'm quite deviant. It's a lot of, the most other peoples don't use this, but I don't want to feel deviant in this, in this respect. So I exaggerate the commonness of this behavior in order to feel better about myself and my, my behavior. Self-serving bias. So now we have, now it's a freeway interaction here. We're talking about two-way interaction so far. Internal and external attribution, difference between actor and observer. That's a two-way interaction according to Mal. The general two-way two -way interaction doesn't show up. So now we have one more factor here. The valence of the behavior, if it's positive or negative. And according to this self-serving bias, at least when it comes to our own behavior, if I behave in a positive way, that something that I, other people approve of, I tend to give my behavior internal explanations. I behaved like this because I'm a nice person. While if I behave in a way that I might be criticized for, or is a failure in some way, then I tend to use external explanations for my own behavior. I behaved like this because the situation was bad. And for other people, this might not be as, uh, as clear. For other people's behavior, we might explain it with internal factors, even if it's a failure. He or she failed because he or she is not good enough, something like that. Okay, and then we'll have an example of this. I found this <laughs> study. Well, I, have, I have all these oldies. It's nobody else in the whole world who have read these studies. I have. You know, a Journal of Personality, uh, Personality and Social Psychology from the 60s, 70s. I'm an expert on those. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I thought this were quite close to myself because it was teachers, or in this case it was teacher-students as subjects. So we have subjects, they're t studying to become teachers, and they're asked to be subjects in this study, and they're asked to keep, uh, keep some short presentations. And in this case it's about mathematics. So for, uh, for instance, the teacher is uh, giving some presentation of how to do multiplication. Okay, a short, and they were given time to prepare this, so they uh, kept uh, short lectures, 
and they were told that behind a dark glass that they couldn't see through, there was sitting a pupil, a young person who was trying to learn whatever they teach to him or her. So this subject keeps a short presentation about multiplication. And there's a pupil behind the glass who tries to learn uh, how to do multiplication from this short lecture. And the pupil is given a test, in this case about multiplication, okay, and receive a result of this. And this subject is shown what result the pupil received on this test. And then this is repeated three more times. So they keep short, uh, short lectures about multiplication, subtraction, and so on. Four, four trials. And for some subjects, it's shown that the pupil behind the glass there that they can't see, they improve their result on this test. They become better and better. Okay. Some other subjects are shown that these pupils result is getting worse and worse. Of course there is no pupil behind this class and this is uh, this is just shown to the to the subjects. And then they are asked to give an explanation. Why does the pupil receive the result that he or she is receiving? Write down an explanation for this. We also have an observer here. You see that this is an observer, right? Another person who sees all this situation, sees the results and so on, but is not involved directly. And also given a, ask to write down, why does the pupil receive the result he or she receives? They write down these explanations, both the actor, the subject, or the subject here, and the observer. And these are coded, the explanations, internal, external. In this case, I showed two, two main categories. They either explain the pupil's result with teaching, with the teaching, with the subject's teaching, or with the situation. Okay? So if the pupil's result improves from trial to trial, the subjects themselves explain this with their own teaching. The pupil received a good result because I, I was good at teaching this. It was my teaching that gave the good result. While if the pupil's result gets worse and worse, they explain this with the situation. The pupil's result became worse and worse, not because of my bad teaching, but because of this situation is very strange. The pupil is sitting behind a dark glass. We can't communicate. I can't even see the pupil and so on. Okay? So, a success are explained with internal factors. My behavior, my good teaching. A failure is explained with bad situational factors. And how is it with the observer, who is not involved directly in this? How do they explain this? Well, with the teaching, in both cases, more than the situation. Especially so if the pupil's result is getting worse and worse. So if I see this from the outside, and I see the pupil's result is getting worse and worse, I explain this with the subject's teaching. Okay, so this is an example of self-serving bias. Some more dimensions. So far we talked about internal, external factors, attribution, but there is some more factors in this also. Of course, there are more possibilities than this, but according to this, we might talk also about global and specific attribution. The cause to this event, is it something global that affects all kinds of different events, or does it affect only this thing? And stable and temporary, the cause to the event, the cause to the behavior, is it in effect only now, or is it effect over longer periods of time? 
three dimensions. So we could ask if you take an example. Let's say, let's say you receive a bad result on the test, and then you try to explain. Why did I receive a bad result on this test? If you would give it internal, stable, and global explanation, how would that sound? I received a bad result on this test because... I always do that on all tests. Yeah, yeah. That could be. For instance, why do you... Why does that always happen on all tests? Yeah, that's what I thought at least. It's internal, it's my fault, it's stable. I'm not just stupid today, I was stupid yesterday, I will continue being stupid tomorrow. And it's global, I'm not only bad at this kind of test, I'm bad at everything. I'm stupid. <laughs> that's an internal, stable and global explanation. Internal, internal sta stable and specific, how would that sound? Let's say it's a math test. If it's internal, stable, but specific. I received a bad result on this math test because of... I'm bad at uh, on that specific subject. Yes. Specific yes, I'm bad at math. I'm not stupid generally, I'm just bad at math. It's my fault. Okay, it's stable. I was bad at math yesterday. I will continue being bad at math tomorrow, but I'm good at other stuff. Internal, temporary, and global. What would that be? I'm stupid today. I'm stupid today. <laughs> yes. Why are you stupid today? Because uh, I'm not tomorrow. Yeah. Something makes you stupid today. You're tired, you're sick, or something like that. It's uh, internal. It's my fault. It's global. <laughs> Uh, would I do a test in history, I would receive a bad result on that also. So it, it's not specific for math, but it's temporary. Tomorrow I will, if I do the test tomorrow, it will turn out fine. Okay, internal, temporary, and specific. What would that be? It was a bad test. Ah, uh, it's internal. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I'm uh, math stupid. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. Tomorrow, I, if I did a history test today, it would be just fine because it's only math I'm tied at. So it's not global, it's specific. It's something to do with math. And it's temporary. If I do a math test tomorrow, it will turn out just fine. Okay. External. Okay, I, I feel this is taking too long time. Okay, so let's... You ready? You ready? Be a bit faster. External, stable, and global. What would that be? I received a bad result on the math test because... The math test sucks. Always sucks. Yeah, that would be make it stable. But it would be quite specific if it's only the math test that sucks. All tests. This, this teacher, all, all the tests he makes are really bad. Not only math, in everything. And it's... So it's global, it's external, it's stable. He always makes bad tests in every subject. S specific would be maybe teacher makes bad math, math tests. History test, it's okay when he makes those. But in math, they're a suck. That's why I received a bad result. External, temporary, and global, what could that be? You will never ch guess my example here which you will if, because you have the handouts in front of you. <laughs> it could be, uh, it's Friday the 13th, <laughs> everything goes to hell. Not only math, everything goes to hell today, but it's temporary because tomorrow, it's Saturday the 14th, and everything will be just sunny again. Tomorrow, I will nail that test. Okay. And external, temporary, and specific. This specific test was bad. Something was wrong with this test. Okay, if I, if I just change the name of the slide up there, did you see that? I can do it again. And we change subject. Depression and self-serving bias. What do you think? How do depressed people? How do we generally? 
If you receive a bad te- uh, result in a test, how would you explain that? <laughs> how do normally functioning happy people explain failures? Yes. The, of course, the most, most uh, non-depressing answer here would be, ah, oh, this test was bad, or something like that, something external. While depressed people might choose that explanation. Failures are due to internal, stable, and global factors. I fail because I'm a bad person. I'm not only bad at this, I'm bad in every way, and it will not be better tomorrow. That kind of association between depression and attribution could be a hypothesis. And maybe in the opposite way if it's uh, success. How would a depressed person explain a good result on the test? It was extremely easy easy and uh, on top of that I was lucky. Something like that. Okay, you know, I have evidence that nothing, uh, not everything goes to hell, but oh, it's specific to this. Everything else will go to hell. While people in general might function in the opposite way. <laughs> Success, oh, I'm so good. Failures, oh, that teacher or external factor is so, so bad. So let's have some data on this, because these have... Uh, matter of argument, is there any relation between attribution, style, and and depression? Okay, so here we have a quite large study, we have 5,000 subjects, they fill in a cognitive style measurement, and uh, this measures how they explain, how they attribute uh, events. Okay, internal factors, global, specific. And they are uh, categorized in two groups, low risk, uh, low level of self-serving bias. Those people who tend to explain failures with internal, global, and stable factors, okay, that low level of self-serving. And those who function in the other way, high level of self-serving who explain successes with internal factors, I'm good, and failures with external factors. It was a bad situation. So you get a score on this test, and we take those 25% with highest level of self-serving bias, and those 25% with lowest level of self-serving bias. And we also measure, try to figure out if they have an earlier history of depression. So this is time zero. Then we have a two and a half year follow up, and the, these subjects are interviewed on several occasions, and we, the interviewers diagnose depression if they have depression. And uh, we have t- three different types of depression: minor, major, and hopelessness depression. Okay, so it's a prospective study. We measure attribution style before and then depression during a follow-up period. And of course that's good if we try to make an explanation that attribution style has a causal effect. It's not only an association. It has a causal effect on depression, on the risk of depression. Then it's of course better to measure attribution style at one time period in time, at one point in time, and then depression later in time. Because then you can't argue the causal causal effect has traveled backward in time. That's usually not a good argument. Okay, so we receive these these results. So the red and the pink bar, that's people with no history of depression. The red bar is low self-serving bias, and the pink is high self-serving bias. And for all three kinds of uh, depressions, the risk is higher for those with low level of self-serving bias. And the, the green and the yellow bar, then it's people with an earlier history of depression, 
the green bar low level of self-serving bias the yellow bar high level of self-serving bias and the same thing here those with low levels of self-serving bias have higher risk of depression than those with high levels of self-serving bias so this is a prospective study it indicates there is an association between self-serving bias and the risk for depression and it would indicate that it's a possible causal effect from attribution style to depression yes how we so it's good with self-serving bias less risk for depression in another study but this was not prospective they had subjects that filled in attribution style questionnaire it measures more or less the same thing how people explain events negative positive events internal uh, global and stable factors okay in this study the attribution style was the same for people who never been depressed as the attribution style for those who had had depression before but wasn't depressed now okay and we can also see in the results here the attribution styles the attribution how people attribute how they explain events have less relation with current depression than with back depression inventory that measures mood is more measurement of mood not uh, clinical depression but uh, measurement of mood so what these researchers the conclusion they draw that how we attribute our attribution style doesn't predict the risk of depression it's rather that how our mood state for the moment has an effect on how we attribute so if we are in a depressed mood for the moment then we tend to attribute then we tend to explain behavior then we tend to explain negative events with internal stable and global factors so it's it's directly the opposite uh, conclusion compared with the previous study in this study they draw the conclusion is depression or mood has an effect on attribution rather than the other way around okay so I guess the jury is out on this it seems that there is at least an association between attribution and depression but the jury is still out on which is the cause and which is the effect I guess there are people have different preferences if you I guess if you work as a therapist you would prefer if the attribution style has an effect on depression because if you alter a person's attribution style you might have an effect on the risk for depression so this is Karolinska so what is mandatory in every every lecture what do we have to have yes we have to have a brain study some pictures of brains so I try to put that in at least one brain picture in every lecture today it came quite rather late but here it is well actually uh, I show there is the brain well I go back <laughs> so MPFC what is that medial prefrontal cortex and self-serving bias is the only relation so we have subjects we put them into the scan and while they're in the scan they get a task to complete here okay so they look at slides and then they get a picture a portrait of a face and that's the target face okay they get some empty slides they get a distractor face empty slide distractor distractor and then they get a probe and then they have to answer this picture is it the same or different compared with the target picture so it's a memory task they have to keep the face in memory and then answer is this the probe face is it the same or is it different compared with the target face 
Okay, so the answer, here the answer yes and no, and then they get some information. Is this incorrect? Was your answer correct or was it incorrect? And this is bogus, so independent of, the, of if they are correct or not, sometimes they get the information that they were correct and sometimes they get the information that they were incorrect. And this has been tried out. The, the task is so difficult that it, you can't be sure that you are correct, even if you would be that. <laughs> so, they get bogus information here, feedback. Okay. And here we scan their, scan their brain. This is where we take the measure. And then they get a chance to give an explanation to why did they why were they correct or why were they incorrect so they have to choose between two answers in this case they get the feedback they were incorrect and then they have to choose between the explanation i am dense i guess that means like i'm stupid or something like that yes <laughs> i am stupid that's why i were incorrect or it was hard so one of these is of course an internal explanation, I am stupid, and the other one is external, the task was difficult. So if it's a failure, they get to choose between one of these internal, I am dense, or I did not try, and one of these external, it was hard, or it was bad luck. If they get the information that they were correct, it was success, internal, I am smart person, I tried very hard, or external, it was easy, it was luck, okay, and from how this, uh, every, so in every answer can be uh, categorized as either a self-serving bias answer, that would be those, I am smart, I, I, I tried hard, and those, it was hard, it was bad luck, those answers are in accordance with the self-serving bias or a non-biased answer, it was easy, I am stupid. That would be not in accordance with the self-serving bias. So what we can see here is, what differences do we see in a person's brain depending on uh, if they are going to be self-serving, uh, give an answer that is in accordance with self-serving bias compared with if they give a non-biased answer. So, what do we, well, here's the result. People give more self-serving biased answers, biased answers than non-biased. That's what we see here. Okay, at least when it's failures, they explain it with external factors more than internal factors if they fail. And we, if we have a look at the brain, and this is a EEG study, so you measure brain waves, so the higher the amplitude, the more active that part of the brain is at the moment. So zero, zero would be not more active than in, uh, in the control situation. So both negative values and positive values here is more activation. And we, what, what they emphasize here that we see more activation more activation in the medial prefrontal cortex when, when people make an unbiased answer compared with if they make a biased answer. So just before people give an unbiased answer, they have a higher activity in the medial prefrontal cortex compared with if they give an answer that is in accordance with the self-serving bias. Okay. Higher activation in medial prefrontal cortex. What, how do we interpret that? What does it indicate? Higher activation, medial prefrontal cortex. Or prefrontal cortex generally. High activity there. When do we have high activity in prefrontal cortex? Ah, yes, that's how they interpret it. Inhibition. So, <laughs> what is our automatic response? What does this indicate? How would we behave automatically? 
with self-serving bias. That's the automatic response. In order not to be self-serving biased, we have to put some effort to it, some mental effort. We have to inhibit this automatic response to be self-serving. We inhibit that response, then we can be unbiased. That's how they interpret this result. But would it also be possible that, uh, since it's uh, also involved in inhibiting the amygdala and things like that, that this activation is in relation of bad feelings, negative feelings, that would come up when you have to do something bad to yourself. So it's not that it has an effect on the decision itself, but it is trying to inhibit the emotional activation that comes from the decision. Okay, so it would be, uh, uh, I guess it's a possibility. It's, well, you, you know what teachers say in this kind of situation. It's probably complex. Yeah, well, uh, bias. Yeah, not probably not a wrong. It's it's it feels like a quite logical answer because it is a hard task. Biased in the sense that it's in accordance with self-serving bias, but it, it doesn't mean that it's a wrong answer. You mean it might look differently if it if people got to do some uh, quite easy task? Yes, it's possible. So, that was today's brain slides. <laughs> <All right. coughs> we have a similar phenomenon, but on the group level. And then it's called group serving bias. Or uh, I think it was this that Pettigrew called the ultimate attribution <laughs> error. I think it's the same. This means that we we explain other people's behavior in a similar way as our own, if they are members of our in-group. So if a in member of in-group fails at something, then we explain it with external factors. It was a hard situation. If a member of the in-group's uh, success succeeds with something, then we explain it with internal factors. Oh, he's very smart, or she's very good at this kind of stuff. And it might be that this might even be in the opposite direction for members of outgroups. I guess especially if our in-group and this particular outgroup have some kind of conflict. That's what these results, it's, I guess Swedes and Norwegians could explain each other's behavior quite similarly, it, even if it might be an in-group and out-group, but it's not really a conflict situation, at least not from our perspective. <laughs> okay, that's why I thought, because both these studies, it's groups that are in com some kind of, I guess, some kind of conflict uh, situation with each other. So this one, uh, all day again, we have, you see that's a Hindu, so we have Hindu subjects. I guess they didn't all look like this, but this guy get to represent the Hindu subjects. Okay, these Hindu subjects read about behavior, examples of behavior, and in these examples are described either pro-social behavior or deviant behavior. So, as an example of pro-social behavior, they read about how a person lends an umbrella to another person who needs it. So pro-social behavior. One of the examples of the deviant behavior was the opposite. They read about how a person refuses to lend an umbrella to somebody who needs it. So it's both positive and negative behavior. And sometimes the Hindu subjects are told that the actor here is also a Hindu. Or they are told that the actor is a Muslim. So either the actor is a member of the in-group or is a member of an out-group. And then they are asked to write down explanation. Why does the actor behave as he or she does? 
and the answers are coded internal external and we say like this so it rate of internal explanations so the Hindu subjects give positive behavior internal explanations to a higher degree if the actor is a member of their in-group compared with if the actor is a member of out-group if it's a Hindu lending an umbrella oh he did that because he's a nice guy if it was a Muslim who landed, did the same act, oh, he did that just because, I don't know, he couldn't do anything else in that situation. Something like that. And opposite, if it's negative behavior. If it's a member of an uh, outgroup, then they give it internal explanations to a high degree. If it's a member of the in-group, then they don't give it internal explanations. Oh, that Muslim didn't lend the umbrella because he was a bad person. Or if it's a Hindu, oh, he didn't lend the umbrella because there was somebody else probably who needed it later. And it was a nice thing that he didn't lend the umbrella in this particular situation. Something like that. Okay. Of course, in this case, it would have been interesting to have also uh, Muslim subjects to see if they... If they do the same but in the opposite direction but they didn't have that in this study but let's go to another it's more or less the same protestants and catholics in northern ireland it's similar maybe okay so we have protestant and catholic uh, subjects on northern ireland gary adams and ian paisley were probably not part of that but they get to represent their respective groups here and all subjects get to see they watch two video clips and these video clips show very violent behavior <laughs> in one of the clips the clips are taken from uh, from uh, tv news so in one of the clips it showed how some protestants attack a catholic funeral with guns and grenades and so on you you're too young to remember it but when i was young this was quite common. I thought it was natural for some parts of the world to shoot at people at funerals and show gra throw grenades at them. I think it happened a few times. So in this case Protestant perpetrators of violent behavior. In the other it's Catholic perpetrators. A Catholic, I don't know, I guess I could call them a mob. A Catholic mob attacks a police car and beats up the police so on. So we have Catholic and Protestant subjects and we have Catholic examples of Catholic and Protestant perpetrators of violent behavior. They watch this and then they explain why do the actors, why do, why do these people behave violently? And the answers are coded internal, external and we see like this. So the higher the bar the more internal explanations are. Or given. So Catholic perpetrators, their, their behavior is explained with internal factors to a higher degree by Protestant subjects than by Catholic subjects. And in the opposite direction if it's Protestant perpetrators. So violent behavior by members of the outgroup is explained with their monsters. <laughs> While the same kind of behavior by members of the in-group is explained maybe oh they were probably very provoked it was a very provocative situation or something like that the victims of the violence had probably done something bad it's explained with external factors okay so group serving bias example of that okay i mentioned this locus of control it's supposed to be a personality trait we it's supposed to be some personal differences of how we explain things and in this case how we explain what happens to ourselves so we have both internal and external locus of control so internal locus of control people with internal locus of control they tend to be, uh, explain what happens to, to themselves by their own behavior, their own choices. 
this happened to me because I chose, made these choices. It happened to me because I behaved in this way. Internal locus of control. External locus of control, then you explain what happens to me has nothing to do with my own choices, my own behavior. It's due to external factors. You feel the difference here? Which do you think is supposed to be nicer <laughs> to have? Internal. Internal. Why? Why would that be better? To have internal locus of control. Because if you, then if you are in a problematic situation, you might be able to fix it yourself. Yeah, at least, at least you think yeah. you could do that. If I have an internal locus of control, I think what happens to me is due to my own behavior, my own choices. Then, of course, I should feel that I can, I can uh, change my life situation. By changing my own behavior, changing my own choices, I can change my own situation. While if you think that everything that happens to me is due to external factors, then it's nothing I can do about it. Right. It's uh, some kind of logical connection between these. Internal locus of control, you feel you can affect your own life. External locus of control, you think I can't do anything about what happens to me. Okay. Then, of course, uh, it could be argued that maybe external locus of control is not so bad to have in some situation. Because, of course, sometimes some people end up in situation that they can't do so much about. And in that case, it might mean that having an external locus of control is protective. I'm in a bad situation. It's not my fault. I can't do anything about it. I'm still a good person. Well, if you have an internal locus of control and still end up in a bad situation, you might blame yourself for this. And of course, that, as we saw, might also be connected to depression. So it could, could be some variation of this. But generally, it's said that internal locus of control would be better. You mean it's in the in the in the culture to explain this way? Well, yeah, maybe. Or in uh, in Cairo, as I saw, inshallah, and you just walk out on the road and you get hit and crippled. <laughs> Actually, I don't think that's completely true. Okay, so let's have a look. This is from one study. And all, again, a prospective study. Uh, so we have 7,500 people burn, uh, uh, born in Britain in 1970. It's a complete cohort. I, they had all who was born in Britain during a week. So that's a cohort. This cohort has been used in many studies. Okay, at 10 years of age, they measure uh, locus of control, intelligence, and other factors. So this is done at 10 years old. Then 20 years later, they gather data about uh, educational level, occupational status, income, health measurements, and so on. So locus of control measured at 10, and 20 years later, we look at the uh, outcome variables. So prospective study. Okay, so here, these bars indicate uh, occupational and educational merit, so from none up to a high level. So five here is the highest level, so they're in order. So if you look at those people with highest level of occupational and educational merit at years 30, they had the highest level of internal locus of control when they were 10. And those who at the age of 30 have lowest level of uh, educational, occupational status, they had the lowest level of internal locus of control 20 years before. And the same with income. A positive relation between locus, internal locus of control and income. Yes? So how, how would we explain this? If we see that internal locus of control at one point in time predicts 
higher levels of education, occupational status and income 20 years later. Why would that be? Does it have relation with impulsiveness? I, I don't know. But, well, the explanation could be something similar as we... I'm just guessing, but could there be a third factor, like, given that people are capable of having a higher locus of control, and uh, therefore there is no direct cause effect? They try to, they try to, I think this data is controlled for intelligence, is controlled for parents, socioeconomic position, and so on. At least they try to do it. Try to do that. Uh, is it because if they uh, if they believe that they are in control in their lives, then it's all up to what they do? Yes. And that's a motivation for them to work harder because no one is going to fix it for them. No, nobody is going to fix it for me. So if I want a good job, if I want a good uh, income, it's up to me to get a good education. I feel motivated to get this. I do it. I'm. I'm I end up in a good position. While if you feel, oh, I can't do anything about my life, well, then it's <laughs> no use getting a good education, but of course, even if I got a good education, everything could go to hell still because of external factors. So it, it probably me feel less motivated to, to work hard to get a good education and so on. Something like that. If we look at the health, health outcomes, it's the same here, but now it's done with logistic regression, which would mean that a value of 1 indicates that it doesn't have any effect on these health measurements. In this case, all values are less than 1, indicates the higher, the higher the internal locus of control at age 10, the lower the probability for these negative health outcomes at age 30. The higher internal locus of control at age 10, the lesser the odds for obesity at age 30. The lesser, you see, that's not significant because it crosses one. The lesser the risk of bad self-rated health at age 30, and so on. They're all negative here, which means the higher internal locus of control, the less risk for these bad health outcomes. And of course, yeah, the, the explanation could be something similar. If I have a high internal of locus of control, I feel I'm responsible to what happens to me. Well, then maybe <laughs> I'm motivated to exercise, not to smoke, and so on, to take care of my health. I, I think I saw some study also that the higher locus of control you have, the more chances is that you will will meet a doctor if you have health problems. If you have health problems, you have high internal locus of control, I can do something about it. this, I go to the doctor and we figure out what we can do. If you have a low internal locus of control, I have health problems, well, c'est la vie. You go, go home, eat potato chips and die. You, you can quote me on that. Yeah. It's more common for them to have things that are not so internal. Yes, yes. Well, that's a hypothesis. You know, this is only British subject. So. so it's possible that there is some cultural difference in this also. Of course, in this case, there is probably that they could look at the risk for, for instance, for instance, obesity. Britain compared with...